Hey, we're live. We're live, Richard. Uh, June 24th. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sunny day here in Andorra. And you know what? It's been crappy, crappy weather for, it seems like forever. So it's a big reprieve for us to finally get some nice weather. Um, we've got some big things happening in the world today, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I've just spent a week uh, in Portugal um, mm -hmm. racing fast cars around the place with a bunch of um, uh, friends. Um, and of course, I go away for a week. And what happens? Well, um, Bitcoin melts up by 25%, and uh, civil war breaks out in Russia. Um, I'm getting uh, I, this happens every time I take a holiday. Yeah, yeah. something like this. I have to chain you to your desk or something <laughs> so we get more stable price action. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting developments. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it's a civil war yet. I, certainly there's, there's a type of a rebellion. Um, uh, you know, I don't worry, we, we don't want to get into the politics of stuff here. But uh, interesting developments for sure. And uh, a lot of confusion right now. But over the coming days and weeks, uh, as things play out, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. And on that note, because we're traders, you know, it's like, okay, any, any world event, doesn't matter what it is. Oh, oh, and we're forgetting about one of the big things that happened this week, the potential Zuckerberg-Musk fight. <laughs> and, you know, D Dana, D Dana White, the president of the UFC, came on and said that uh, it's, a, it's a go, whether it is or not, we'll see. But uh, he said that it could be the largest pay-per-view pay event ever in the history of the world. And I wouldn't doubt it. And it could raise hundreds of millions of dollars for charity. So it's interesting. But everything um, that happens in the world, you know, if there's a way we can trade it, let's figure out how we can trade it. <laughs> so, so discussing the, um, you know, the potential, um, uh, you know, problems that they're having internally in Russia, we're going to run a little poll here. What would civil war in Russia mean for Bitcoin prices? Now, I'm not saying it's civil war yet. We're just saying it's that happened. Uh, do you think they could go up, down, or would it have no effect? So that that uh, poll is published now. Go ahead and put in your thoughts and let us know what you think what, what would happen to the prices of crypto assets. All right. So uh, just checking how we got some people on with us. Great. Uh, Hey, hello, Alwyn, Def, Luke, Gendrea. Hey, good to see the Italians are here again. You know, Richard, have you ever been to Lake Como? I have. Yeah. Oh, I've never been there. It's one of those kind of places I feel like I need to go to. And uh, It was um, Pliny the Elder's favorite, favorite place. Oh. Uh, I have a friend whose father lives there. Oh, yeah, nice place. Uh, very humid, but uh, it's very sort of damp atmosphere. Um, so it's probably great on a on a really beautiful summer's day when the sun's right down on you, but um, it, it, there's a lot of mist around it around the lake. So it's quite you know it's quite picturesque. Interesting. Probably not as misty as you know Loch Ness or something. I, I'm, uh, I'm yeah, it's a little nicer than that. I think I think we may as well get going here. It's five after. We got lots of people joining us. Uh, great to have you with us, everyone. Uh, let me just bring up the slide. We'll give you the agenda for today, and then we'll get into some trades. Uh, where are we here? Trading crypto options, the pros. Hey, that's us, the pros, <laughs> just just in case you're wondering. So today we're going to talk about um, the current market analysis, and finally we've got something to talk about. You know, the last couple of weeks there hasn't been a heck of a lot going on, so uh, we've got some action now. That's great. So we're going to talk about some of our current trades, uh, review those and the strategies that we're looking at right now. And then we're going to talk about covered call campaigns, just specifically covered call campaigns. We're talking a little bit about choosing strike prices. I think choosing strike prices is one of those questions that comes up all, all the time. It's like, well, okay, I, I can do this, but what, what strike price do I choose? So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let me uh, stop the slides. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to get straight into um, what positions I've put on. Uh, since basically the beginning of the week uh, when things started to to roll, uh, to rock and roll. So let me just go and share this now. Can you see my ETH silly chart? I can, yeah. Now, the first thing I want to mention is, you know, I call it my silly chart. Why do I call it my silly chart? Because I've got two lines on it. Two lines, that's it, that's it. 
Now I've, I've taken those technical analysis courses. So one could say I'm a technical analysis analyst, but um, I don't rely on it uh, except for a very macro thing. Now, if we're trading micro, if we're trading zero date expiration stuff, if we're scalping, then um, indicators can, you know, you get all kinds of indicators. That's good. But I just want to point this out. Just look at this Ethereum chart. I drew this way back. I don't know. Like, you know, let me turn the little whiteboard on here. Um, I drew this way back probably. Oh, it's not working again. I'm not sure why. Uh, uh, right. Anyways, you can see my mouse, right? Yeah. Somewhere around here, I, st I drew this. I said, well, this is the line. And, and you know, Whenever you're whenever you're doing anything with technical analysis, you need to look to your left. You look to your left. So you look at the past to give you ideas of what's going to happen in the future. So I drew these lines, and I used to have a unicorn down here. I think I still got it on my on my, my Bitcoin chart. Yes, I do have my unicorn on the Bitcoin chart. Uh, I've got the unicorn over here. But take a look at this, ETH. I drew this line, and a few times it came down here, and someone said, "Ha ha, Shane, you know your your chart sucks. It's not doing anything." Well, looky, looky, it stuck right to it. This is just some line I drew. It broke it and came right back to it, and then we bounced up from there. So I know Richard thinks that you know technical analysis is a lot like you know reading burnt animal entrails or, or things like that, but let's take a look at the Bitcoin silly chart. Here's my unicorn down here I was looking for. We haven't gotten the unicorn. In fact, we've gone the other way. Maybe we'll never get the unicorn. I don't know. That's okay. We'll, we'll have a new unicorn at some point. But look, it came right down to the line, like literally right down and bounced off that line. Isn't that kind of amazing? Is that just a sheer coincidence, Richard? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Boy, one coincidence after another. That's incredible. Okay. All right. So let's talk about actually. Let's go to uh, Ethereum first now, uh, because my my the whiteboard was it was acting up a little bit earlier on me too. I'm not sure why it's not working here, but I can draw on this chart itself. So, anyways, what did I have on? Well, before this thing started down over here, um, before this rally started, I did have some uh, June 30th short calls around 1,900 level. Uh, so if if I get my little thing. Uh, Right, right around here, actually. This is this is about nineteen hundred bucks right there. Now I did have those. As this thing moved up hard, I did roll those out to the nineteen fifties. So I rolled them up to about uh, where's nineteen fifties right there to June seventh. I still got those, and I did that for a flat trade, so it didn't cost me anything, um, and I didn't get paid anything. It was, it was relatively flat. So I, that that's all I've done there. Uh, so maybe I'll just go ahead and add a new one here. So there we go. And I'll, if I change this color, you'll see that, uh, you know, I'll just make it red. There we go. So so I ended up selling that and opened a new one above. So this is actually part of some covered calls. I'm not worried about these. I didn't have a lot of positions on with either Bitcoin or Ethereum because volume was really low. When we were down here, volume was low. We were just playing light because we didn't want to get stuck in anything. If you know, We knew something was going to happen eventually, whether it was in six days or six months, who knows, right? So that's what I had going on there in ETH. What was the next thing I had happening? Uh, let's see. Short June 1900 calls, rolled them flat. Yep. I, now, I did have some June 2100 shorts as well. So 2100 way up here. Uh, oh, come on, work. There we go. Uh, those are June 30th. Okay. 2100 shorts I had up there. Now, those were, I, I basically, I just added to them. I didn't do a darn thing with them. As things were moving up here, this is kind of scary. We're like, oh my gosh, you can keep going forever, right? And they, they could have, who knows, right? All I did was I added a little bit more to that position, that short position. Uh, those calls were around 65% IV at the time. And what I did was I actually used the proceeds of those to buy some July, and month of July. So July 28th, I think the expiry in July. They were trading around 45% IV. And I think those were 1,700 puts. So I sold some down there and then I used the proceeds to buy some, some puts somewhere down here, which go out to 
uh, to July. Why did I do that? Because I didn't know if this rally was going to keep going. Maybe, maybe we're going to keep drifting up for the next six months. I don't know. Who knows? We could retrace this. I don't know. It's all. I, I don't. I don't try and predict the markets. But when when puts are cheap, I try and buy them, and they were free. I sold these. I felt pretty comfortable with these up here. These these twenty one hundreds that I sold. So I used the proceeds to buy some puts. If they pay off, great. If they don't, it didn't cost me a damn thing. So I'm not too worried about it. Uh, what else did I have here on some other accounts? No, I did have some. I sold some two thousand calls uh, for June. Okay, so June two thousands I sold uh, in some smaller accounts right around here when we were farting around in this area. They expire, of course, at the end of this week. Uh, so I should move them back here. And I did sell some nineteen fifty uh, July sevens as well. So those are around here. I'm happy with these. These are all covered calls. Now, a little portion of them might be a little bit naked. I don't really worry too much about having a little bit of naked covered calls uh, because on, on the call side, sorry, naked calls, because um, I feel I can usually effectively roll them. Uh, if they were heavy, then I'd be concerned. and I wouldn't recommend anyone doing that. I would recommend selling that as a short vertical spread or something like that. Now, Bitcoin, what did I have going on in Bitcoin? I had a short June 30th, 29,000 calls. Okay. Where is the 29K? Right around here. Right? Yep. Oops. That was supposed to be a... That's supposed to be a line, not a not a thing. But anyways, that that's the line. It was a blue up through there, right? So I rolled them to ninety uh, uh, to where did I roll them to? Uh, to uh, twenty nine five hundred for a credit. Oh yeah, that's right. This is what I did. Sorry, I'm having trouble remembering what I was doing because there's just so much damn stuff going on this afternoon. I rolled them up to twenty nine uh, to twenty nine five. You know, went, went five hundred bucks higher. Then I rolled them up again as this thing kept moving up and up and up. I rolled them up to the June, or the July 28th, 31 Ks for a credit. And that's where they sit right now. 31 is right about there. Okay. So you can see I rolled this twice. I started off here, closed that. Started off here, closed that. And now I've got this. It didn't cost me a cent. I rolled them. I rolled them. And in fact, I actually made a little bit of money because the IVs were, were quite high. I rolled them just before they got to the money or, or close at the money. And so I'm sitting with this. And now these are Julys, remember. So I've got, uh, we've got just over 30 days. So we've got about five weeks uh, for these to go. So what, what am I going to do here? Well, if by July, you know, if this thing blows up and through, we keep churning up and up, well, I'll just keep rolling the darn thing up. Um, or I might roll it in, more likely roll it into a strangle at some point. Uh, and it might be a lopsided strangle. Uh, if we come down, happy days, I'm just going to sit and hold on it and let the darn thing expire because we don't have that far to expire. And time decay is really going to start to become a factor for it. Too sweet. Uh, what else did I do? I sold some 34,000 calls and I bought some uh, July 28th, 36,000 calls. Yes, so I did have a bit of, sorry, I did a bit of a spread here. So, and this is in a separate account. So I sold some 34s. So basically here, I sold those at 34. And these are uh, July 7th, okay, July 7th. And I bought some 36,000, okay, bought some 36s way out here, July's. Okay, so it's a bit of a calendar spread. These are obviously going to uh, decay a lot faster. I, my view is quite high. I, who knows if we'll get there. Uh, but even if we just start farting around, farting around here, and these, these expire worthless, I'll sell another set of calls against those Julys. I might sell the weeklies against it. I might just sell the monthly against it. So that's all I've got going on over here, Richard. Um, I'm happy to just sit down right now. We've calmed down. It's the weekend, so I mean, let, let's face it. You know the, uh, you know, I shouldn't say let's face it. The last two weekends is when we've had some big moves. We've had some big moves the last couple of weekends. So uh, things could happen this weekend. Uh, there could be some fireworks of the stuff going on in Russia. There's been a lot of news coming out 
a um, lot of stuff coming out of the States. Who knows? But um, I'm looking forward for a fairly calm weekend. I wouldn't be surprised 50-50 if we kept trending up slowly, where we started to reverse a little bit of this trend, uh, the, this last move we made over the last week. I'm not saying it's going to reverse completely, but I wouldn't be surprised either way. Uh, my margin use is low. Uh, I've really not even given a second thought uh, about any of these positions. I'm perfectly happy with everything I have on. What do you got going on? Uh, me, yeah, complete, the complete opposite. Um, <laughs> of course. Do a quick um, screen share. Uh... Bitcoin. There we go. <clears throat> so here's um, here's the carnage. Well, it actually looks like carnage, but it's not that bad actually. Um, so first thing to notice. Um, so I was short calls all the way down at twenty. We were down at twenty five thousand, right? Um, and we've pumped up yeah. about twenty four percent, up to thirty one thousand in about three days, which is uh, it's quite a big move. Um, it's you see that moving um, so the first thing you'll see is, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, my maintenance margin is currently at 61%, uh, which seems high, and definitely don't do this at home, but um, I'm actually quite, quite comfortable with that. Um, I, I'm short futures to turn all of my underlying two Bitcoins into synthetic dollars, and that automatically takes about 20% off the margin, um, or uses about 20% of margin. Just there's just the act of doing that. So in my mind, I'm actually only using 40% margin, which is still slightly high. But at the end of a 25% rally, I'm, I'm okay with that. So you'll notice that um, I've got a bunch of risks sitting here in 30th of June, a load of calls, um, half of them are in the money, and half of them are out of the money. I, I'm not really too bothered about these ones being in the money, because if you look just down here a little bit, you see the Bitcoin 30th of June futures. I'm long... Uh, uh, they do it in dollars, uh, so that's $95,000. It's about three Bitcoins, right? If I look at the delta, um, delta, 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 a bit further across. Stand at delta, there we go. Uh, yeah, 3.1. Um, and if you look down in my my uh, options positions, you see the 30th of June's net delta is about minus 3.3. So they, they match off nicely. Um, and what I try and do is keep the, the options deltas matched off with um, with uh, dated futures, and that's so that I come expiry, and particularly for the 30th of June, which are expiring Friday, um, I'd like I want the options and the futures to expire together, so I don't get any delta mismatches. Um, I also like to keep my net perpetuals negative because I like to be earning carry. Uh, you tend to earn more carry being short perpetuals than you do being short futures, um, so I prefer to be long futures and short perps, even when the market goes down. Oddly enough. Um, so uh, what I'm doing at the moment, th this um, 31,000 call per call, um, I used to have 1.1 uh, short there. Uh, this morning I rolled 0.3 of it away. So what I'm doing here is I'm just looking to take advantage of the fact that we're now, the, 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 at the money vol here is 46-ish, 47. And if I go out to July uh, 7th, I can probably get up to about 30 delta to get 48 uh, or maybe 20 delta maybe get about 50 volt um so what i'm what i'm actually be looking to do over the weekend is just quietly um offer um these uh, sort of quietly bid for for these um uh calls just point one at a time and then as i get filled on each one i'll then go and sell a strangle in either the 7th of july or 14th of july just to get rid of this sort of at the money position. Because the only thing is about this being at the money, it's fine, it, it generates me lots of theta, uh, but it's got quite a lot, lot of gamma. Um, and so I don't, I, I really want to control that. I don't really want to be continuously delta hedging with futures, it just burns money. I'd ra rather just get the, the gamma lower um, and push that risk a bit further out. So you can see in my options, my theta line, here we go. I'm earning at the moment $530 a day, um, theoretically, Overall, $300 of it is coming from 30th of June, so that I'm getting that for the next week. And then 153 from 7th of July and 38 from 14th of July. So in my mind, I want to push, I, I want to push at least 150 bucks of decay out to 14th of July to start balancing up and any, in evening out where I'm, where I'm getting my, uh, my delta decay from. Sorry, theta decay from. 
Um, these positions have all been written systematically. So um, these 30th of June's uh, started being written as 10 Delta calls way, way out, uh, sort of two months to run. I was writing 30 Delta calls as well, and they've all moved up into the money and they've become effectively strangles because of because I'm on futures. But to do this, you've got to obviously be on the ball and be Delta hedging um, religiously. Otherwise... And it yeah, now Richard, I think that's a good point too. When you with your margin use is so high, it's not bothering you. And you talked about the twenty percent discount, but also you're hedging. Um, yeah, I was going to say, look, if if you look at, if you look at my total futures position, uh, I'm actually long one hundred and twenty thousand dollars of futures on a on a this this account contains two bitcoins, right? If you look at my wallet here, um, wallet, uh, where's the wallet thing? There we are, wallet. So cash balance is two bitcoins. Um, current equity is 1.6. So what that's kind of telling me is that we've got, I, I'm expecting to receive 0.4 Bitcoins over the next, um, I don't know, month or so in terms of time decay. Um, and so yeah, here I am on a on a, a two Bitcoin account uh, and I'm long uh, 3.8 Bitcoins of futures on it and short a mother load of, uh, of, of um, uh, was the net, net delta on the options? Uh, five, five bitcoins of uh, short on the options. So it's all, you know, actually the the, the cash on the account starting to fade into insignificance. What's more important is the sort of net P and L position. Um, and this is this is not unusual for for a, a book that's been aging and um, you've been hedging with futures rather than rolling positions. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's all for me. I think yeah. The um, uh, I, I'm what I'm looking to do here is just yeah roll out those at the monies um, and then just sit and wait for this time decay to come in. Just bear in mind that a, a week ago this at the money uh, one week was trading at about thirty five percent vol. It's currently forty six mm -hmm. and it was up to fifty two ish, fifty five ish even actually at the end of last week. Or, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, I I'm kind of personally happy to sell anything above 55 volt on Bitcoin at the moment. So I'm so in one week I'm probably selling nothing more here. But if we go out to two weeks or maybe three weeks, uh, 50 volt, 20 delta, yeah, 53 volt, 17 delta, uh, 13 delta here at 56 volt. I'm I can sell all that all day long. That's fine. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think too, as far as the upcoming week is concerned, or even the upcoming weeks, uh, you know, the the level we're at is, you know, technically, it's where we got stuck back in, uh, like like May June of last year, um, or or sorry, uh, yeah yeah May June of last year, at, at this area. So, I I think that it, for it to really launch, out of, and it could. I mean, anything could happen. It's the market, right? Um, uh, we, we would have to have a bit of a catalyst for that to happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if we kind of went sideways for a bit, uh, drifted down, you know, maybe Bitcoin might go down, you know, one or two, 2,000 bucks and just kind of drift around, bounce back up and, and fart around. That's how I'm planning to play this. That's why I have not right now a lot of concern of any of the short calls I have. Um, how am I going to play this? Well, I'm just going to let, like you, I'm just going to sit and wait, uh, wait for that time. Uh, decay to to, uh, to to pay off. If we have a big move down, I will be a contrarian. I will take the other side of that move at some point where I feel it's getting exhausted for a bounce because I don't think that we're going to uh, you know, break out of the previous range on the downside. That'd be an excellent opportunity, I think, to sell some put spreads down there, maybe even go long uh, some calls or some long vertical spreads. Uh, but again, I kind of have a feeling we're going to go a little bit sideways in, in channel. Um, yeah, the, the only um, wild card here is that um, 30th of June is a big expiry. I think it's the biggest open interest that I've seen for a while, maybe even ever, uh, looking at the, the communications coming out. Mm -hmm. And it's an expiry where we've seen a whole bunch of... So if you can imagine that like everyone in the world sells 30, 30 Delta Strangles, um, and so anyone who's been doing that you've got uh, has got risk all over all over um 30 june and i think the 
max pain number is, is as around about 25,000, isn't it? Um, and they do say that um, max pain tends to act as a, as a, as a magnet for, for um, spot. That would be very interesting if that happened. Uh, yeah. Of course, I, I'd love it because all those calls would just be yeah. <clears throat> worthless. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not. So, I, I'm pretty sure that. I think a lot of the traffic we've seen has been institutionally based. I, I've been watching mm -hmm. this. Um, so whenever we get a big move, before it happens, oddly, we see a spike in vault. Um, it always happens in US hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm almost wondering whether some people are putting big trades on through CME, and then and then market makers on Darabit are seeing that and replaying it back through Darabit. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, for both the, the big down moves and the big up moves, often I'm seeing like a five vol spike of the at the monies mm -hmm. uh, in one month before um, the market starts to move. And uh, that's, that's been quite interesting. Um, yeah, that is. Uh, well, we'll and, keep uh, our eye on that. And actually this morning, well, I saw a strange thing just before 8 a.m. GMT, uh, just before expiry. I saw vols drop from 45 down to about 40 for about, for about two minutes. Hmm. Um, almost as if like one major market maker dropped out or, had a glitch in their in their price up, uh, pricing engine, um, and then came back in. Uh, and for a moment, all my account values jumped like five like <laughs> percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I should I should have just dove, dove in there and bought everything, but <laughs> it wasn't yeah. quick enough. <laughs> Hindsight. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just. Uh, I, I think we've covered sort of what, we, what we've got going on. I think we've you know we're we're we got a basic view of, of what's happened and how we've dealt with um, a pretty sizable move over the last uh, four or five days. So uh, it was pretty exciting. Actually, it wasn't that exciting. It was just exciting because nothing's happened for so long. So it was exciting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because, you know, in, in the world of crypto, you know, that, that's a significant, you know, that, that's a good move, but it's not the move. So. Well, I, I mean, that would have been an exciting, if you, if you were doing what I'm doing and manually hedging, that would have been an exciting day because you'd have felt pretty exhausted after yeah. sort of 36 hours of, of continuous uh, delta hedging. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite a high stakes poker, right? Because uh, I've got a robot there doing that for me, but it, tra it traded, you know, probably like a million dollars of Bitcoin notional, probably more. And it accrued a, a three, a, uh, hundred hundred and twenty thousand dollar position um over that time all while i was um playing with my kids in the garden and uh flying from portugal to, uh, to from lisbon to um barcelona <laughs> good thing you got the hedger <laughs> because murphy's law states you know if yeah. you've got a position if, some, if something's going to happen when you can't be at the computer that's just the way it goes so yeah all right, so let's let's move on. Uh, I, I prepared some slides. I, I did up a few slides just to show a basics of a covered call campaign. And I just rounded off numbers just to show a campaign. And that's what we're going to talk about today and, and choosing some strike prices. And this is really interesting because covered call campaigns are something that I think are, uh, well, everyone does them. Anyone can do them. As we discussed last week, doesn't matter the, the account size you have. Uh, institutional, retail, small account, big account, cover call campaigns can be very lucrative over time. And so let's just take a look at Bitcoin. I just do this based on Bitcoin. So we don't have to worry about uh, assignment and exercise, things like that. And in this case, we're going to just talk about um, taking it to expiry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, we're going to start this campaign at the beginning of March, and we're going to write the next monthly. So roughly 30 days later, we're going to let that expire. And then as soon as that expires, we're going to write another one for the next month, uh, about 30 days out. We'll just roll that over, roll that over. I just went back to March. I could have went back to whatever. And in fact, I think what Rich and I are going to do is um, now that he's back, we might pull some data and look at, okay, what if we did this for the last year? And at, use the actual market data versus just you know eyeballing it uh, approximately. And where, 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 where would we be? Where would we have ended up if we'd done this for a year selling? In this case, I'm selling approximately a 20 delta every single month. So, so a covered call campaign is just a systemic writing of covered calls for a set period of time. So you could say, hey, I'm going to do a campaign for six months or a year or forever. You know, 
have it forever. I mean, if you own a stock and you want to hold that stock, it pays you a dividend or something. You might just write calls ad nauseum in, in, until you get rid of that stock or your sentiment changes on the stock, whatever. Uh, the point is just to generate consistent monthly revenue. Okay, so in this case, and I just explained, we're going to be looking at about uh, 30 days out, uh, 20 delta, and 20 delta, of course, it, because we're using delta in this case as a, um, a percentage of, of profitability. So our, our percentage of profitability will be about 80% because 20 delta is saying that the market is saying that there's a 20% chance that that option will expire in the money. As sellers, we want it to expire out of the money. So there's about an 80% chance it'll expire out of the money. Uh, repeat it every month, uh, and we'll start in March using Bitcoin. So if everyone can see this okay, basically starting in March 1st, you can see there, and I've got the green, uh, the green arrow. I wonder if my whiteboard will work now. Let me see if it works now. No, it doesn't work. I, I, I wonder why. We've got a little glitch in our, our system here. Hmm. No worries. You can see the, the green line starting March 1st goes straight up. And then I've done a green line along the top. Now, that top line is 27000 So that's the strike price. And I've extended it out to March 31st when it expires. So anything that ends up in underneath that sort of little umbrella if it expires under there, we keep all the premium, right? So in this case, Mars first, we sell the 27K strike. Uh, it was around 23,500 at the time. Uh, expiring, we got $400 for that. We, got, we collected $400 in premium. Cool. And actually, before anyone says, um, if you look at the chart and see that soon after the market dropped to 20,000, um, and there's a good chance actually that that, 20 Delta call would have been close to worthless at that point. And so a diligent and observant um, trader would actually have bought that back for super cheap mm -hmm. and then rewritten it uh, on the 13th or thereabouts after the rally. Just um, so th th that would be a way to increase the, the, the gains. But nevertheless, um, in this case. Uh, yeah, and I think what we're going to talk about too, uh, Richard, next week is we're going to talk about adjusting covered calls because uh, in, th in this case we're just we're just saying hey we're going to let it run to expiry. Yeah, at there it would be would have been worthless. We probably would have bought it back. And whether we would have waited to the end of the month to sell the new ones, we stay on schedule, or we would have sold a new one right away. I don't know, but uh, either way, um, that's what happened. And of course, all the stuff to the right, we don't know that happened, right? We have no idea where this thing's going to go. Right after March first, looks like it was going straight to zero, right? So. Uh, crazy we just never we never really know but if we forward to the end of march we can see where the blue arrows pointing were expired it actually expired above our strike price which is what we don't want right interesting so we you know quote unquote lose eight hundred dollars which is the market price of twenty seven thousand eight hundred minus the strike price of twenty seven thousand but you have to remember that we're gaining on the underlying asset it, 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 which went up about $4,300. So the upside risk is that it, it is really only that we're going to not participate in market rises beyond the short strike. That's why I say we lose in quotation marks. Um, you know, it, it is a cash deficit, uh, but uh, we gained. So we just capped, we, we capped our gains basically at, at 27,000 is what we did by writing that 27,000 call strike. Okay. So, we're at the end of March and we have to write a new one. So we write a new one and we write about a 20 Delta call and that's an April 28th and it's 31,000 happens to be the 20 Delta strike and we collect $450 in premium for it. Okay. We can see all the way to the end of April, the blue line that expires worthlessly. We just keep the 450 bucks and guess what? We write a new one, right? For May. So let's write a new one for May. 20 Delta strike happens to be 33,000. We collect $425 for that. In this case, we can see that, sure enough, you know, the blue arrow is pointing. It expires way, way down, so we keep all the 425 May comes along, and we're writing June, the month we're in now. So June, we write 20 Delta, but we only get $390 for it. The IV was quite low in June. If we remember, it was really getting low, and we were kind of like, eh, we don't want to get too crazy on selling too much IV right now. And sure enough, we did have a big spike. It could have went down, could have went up, who knows. But we're still well within our um, 
32,000 parameter. We've got a week to go. Of course, if it if, if the price of Bitcoin stays under 32,000 by June 30th, we will keep all that premium, that 390 bucks. But that hasn't happened yet. Who knows? So if we look at our scorecard, when we started in March, we actually lost 400 bucks. Well, it was $800, but we collected 400 in premium. So it's a $400 loss. April, we collected it all. Uh, May, we collected it and we kept it all. In June, well, we may or may not collect it all. So we're talking about 865 bucks uh, so far that's confirmed. But the thing I want to uh, point out here is, let's say we came into the Bitcoin market on March 1st. We didn't have any Bitcoin. We bought one Bitcoin. We thought, no, we're going to buy a Bitcoin and we're going to do a covered call campaign. Every month we have this, we're going to sell a call against it. Well, the value of Bitcoin increased over 3000 bucks, right? So you have to take that into consideration. Yes, there are some months, such as uh, on March, where we sold a call and expired above that price. We capped our loss. That's all we're doing. We're still capturing gains, okay? So that's an important point there. Now, the next thing we come to is some people say, well, why did you sell a 20 Delta? Why are you choosing those strikes? There is no wrong choice when you're selling strike prices. Your strike is going to be determined, it's going to determine the amount of premium and how much upside, how much room, run, uh, like room to run you're going to give the underlying asset, whether it's you know Bitcoin or our stock or whatever, before being capped off. With Bitcoin, I mean, we just saw a move from about 25, 25 and a half up to 30, 31. That's a sizable move, right? That doesn't happen every day. Every month, you know, you have to go back and look at the averages, okay? It comes down to your sentiment and it comes down to your bias. If you're really, really bullish on Bitcoin, then maybe don't sell some covered calls or you're going to choose a farther strike price. Maybe you're going to be selling 15 delta, you know, further away from the money, okay? Now, it's very common for most people in the traditional TradFi world when they're running covered call campaigns, they're probably selling anywhere sort of 15, 16 delta up to around 30 on the high side. 30 is getting pretty close to your to the market price. And, you know, there's, you know, 70% chance it's going to expire uh, in, in your favor, but 30%, you know, 30 delta. You know, things can change quick, right? So that's that's the typical range that you're going to see most people do. And the one thing, so the other day, so I think this is on Wednesday or Thursday, I made up this little chart. I said, okay, Bitcoin at that, at that moment was at 29,000, almost exactly. So I said, okay, let's say I sold an at the money call right now on Bitcoin. If I sold the 29,000 call at that moment, it was actually a, a 0.55 delta, as you can see, okay, because we were skewed to the upside. We would have collected $2,200, $2,200. That takes us up beyond 31,000, okay, in terms of that premium we're receiving versus the, the, how, how much it could appreciate. So if we went, if we scaled it down and said, okay, we, we sold the, thir- the, 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 um, uh, the 30,000 strike. Well, that was a 50 delta. We've got 1750. And you can see the amount as we get further and further out of the money, those strikes get further and further out. We're collecting less and less, which makes sense. The delta is going down and down. But we're like, we were looking at 33,000 delta at that time. That was a 30 delta call. I know that the 20 delta was probably, you know, like, like the, you know, the uh, you know, 35 or something or 34 and a half or w- whatever it happened to be. But still, you can collect 900 bucks. So let's say you wanted to play it safe in this case and say, hey, what? I'm just going to sell the 30 delta call. I'm going to collect $900 in premium. That's pretty good. You're giving yourself a lot of room for that stock to move. You know, that stock can, is going to run 4000 more dollars after it's run from 25 it just made. I mean, it could. Doesn't seem too likely to me. It could. Anything can happen. But that's, I'm not going to say it's free money, but it's as close to free money as you're going to get at that point. Now, of course, let's say that we're completely wrong. And at that point, Bitcoin exploded and went up to 40000 well, all we're doing, it, it's its not a bad thing. We just didn't make as much money as we could have. We made the money between 29 and 33. So we made four grand there. Plus you got to add on the 900 bucks we made. We just missed out in the appreciation between 33 and 40. Okay, and it sucks and we kick ourselves in the butt, whatever, but we carry on and move on. 
So that's how you have to look at, at these covered calls. It really comes down to your sentiment. You can sell an at the money covered call. If your sentiment is that the thing is going to stay sideways or even go down, why not? You can a lot of premium. Another way to think about um, if you if your covered call expires in the money, um, it's going to actually convert some of your bitcoins into dollars effectively because uh, it's actually delivering dollars. Um, and uh, so you could think of that then as if you then the next month sell the put at the same strike, um, and then you're hoping to get put back into Bitcoin. Um, so that's uh, if if you if you're concerned about giving up the bitcoins as opposed to um, giving up the dollar value, because mm-hmm. uh, some people will, will be doing this to accumulate more bitcoins and some will be accumulating doing it to accumulate more dollars. In fact, mm-hmm. uh, while you were doing that um, illustration, you, you said we made what eight hundred and fifty dollars or something uh, over the three yes, months. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that that equated to three point two percent bitcoin, mm-hmm. or a, a bitcoin yield. Um, so if you're a Bitcoin maximalist and you're looking to just do this to collect Bitcoin, mm-hmm. then you were, you know, you were annualizing oh, about 14% uh, Bitcoin yield, which is, you know, better than you're, than you're going to get anywhere else. And, you know, th- through a lot of this demonstration too, we were in a pretty low IV environment. Um, mm. So other environments you, you would have, you know, maybe that would have been you know, 1,200 you would have made or something. So, who, who knows? Yeah, it's worth saying that, yeah, because uh, uh, during the loss of the past month, particularly, um, the skew on Bitcoin has been negative, And that is the the calls have been priced lower than the puts. So it's been a bad time to sell calls. Um, and as well as the market dropping, the implied volatility was also dropping, which is a quite a sort of, sort of a confounding situation. And so you, you were sort of forced into a position where you were selling calls super cheap. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, as as my book just displays, but almost in a, in a situation like that, you might want to just take a pause and say, well, you know what, it just doesn't feel right. I'm not going to sell those calls. Mm-hmm. I'll mm-hmm. just wait. Okay. Hey, look at this. It's a quarter two for the first time ever. For the first time ever, we were, were on time <laughs> and we cut it within 45 minutes. So we can probably go to a, a, a Q&A now. Uh, once again, I'll just mention we've got the, uh, if you don't have a Darabit account, sign up at the top, save 10%. There's a link up there. It's our link. And we do have a little special offer. Again, seven days access uh, or 14 days access for seven bucks for Rogue Trader Academy. And I will put that into the uh, chat as well. Uh, okay, guys, let's let's go to Q&A. And uh, let, let me just actually... Uh, Richard, if you want to take the first one, and let me just adjust this slide. Yeah, here. sure. So the first question is from Luke. Uh, isn't rolling? Uh, I'm going to insert simply postponing execution. So you're, yeah, you're kind of, you're being, you're postponing the day of reckoning. Um, and um, if you're in the money and you're rolling, then you're obviously looking to avoid um, being exercised in the money. Um, of course, what you're really just, just doing is buying buying a short dated option and selling a longer dated option or a strangle. But um, the real reason to do it, well, there's a few reasons, but the the first is that you've got control over the book, over when, what gets expired and when. Because uh, the last thing you want to be doing is sitting on a at the money call and maybe put um, with one hour to go to expiry and then suddenly some news comes out, the market moves a thousand bucks because um, the game is going to be horrible and you're going to end up a thousand dollars offside whatever you do, there's no, there's no hedging it. So you kind of don't want to be in that situation. Uh, so if you are going to be holding to expiry, you, uh, personally, I prefer to be holding a whole bunch of strikes um, and continually hedging with futures into expiry. And so to save myself the bother of doing that, because it's hard work, <clears throat> and something that market makers will do also with automated systems, uh, so you don't have to, better just to roll out of the, the position with maybe a day or two to go, um, go and sell it a week later or a, a month later or whatever it takes your fancy. Maybe get a better a better strike, get further from the money. Maybe get more premium, whatever your your gag is. I, I personally use rolling to. If I've got an at the money position, as I mentioned to you on my book, I've got these at the money one week calls. Um, I the reason I want to roll them is not really anything other than I can get more implied volatility somewhere else, so I can buy those calls at 45 vol, sell them at 60, 
uh, somewhere else and pick up those 15 bowls uh, over the next two weeks. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I'm rambling again. I do that. I ramble a lot. All right. That's all good. Uh, what else we got here? Can you set a price alert that they're about trading view? You know, that, that, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I'm not a power user on trading view. I just happen to have it uh, because it's got a little bit more functionality I mean, for the most of what I'm doing. I'm using the charts and there of it. Uh, but, um, you know, trading view does give you that extra functionality. And I know plenty of people who do set price alerts and I have had price alerts come to my uh, phone before, but I don't, I've never looked into having it with there of it, but, but something I can look into. Um, do you actually have your own pricing or just following the market price? Oh, this is a good question because actually it's different for both of us. Um, so Shane's using the Deribit screen prices and I am, I am in terms of measuring my, my mark to market p &L every day. Um, so when I'm reporting the p on the, on the books I trade, uh, I'm doing it on Deribit marks because nothing else makes any sense because they're a bit are going to give me on margin calls based on what they think the prices are, not what I think the prices are. But actually, I do also have my own pricing, and I also I compare our model, my my my, my institutional model, with the prices I see on Deribit, and that gives me some guidance as to what I want to buy and sell. Um, uh, yeah, so I will if I think calls are too cheap relative to puts for example i will sell calls and buy puts and then hedge with futures and if i think puts are too cheap compared to calls i'll sell puts and buy calls and hedge the other way with futures and if i think the long dated is too cheap and the far dated is sorry the long dated is too cheap and the short dated is too expensive i'll, I'll sell and buy it so I'll, I'll do that kind of juggling mm -hmm. um but on the whole um just trading what you see on the screen on Deribit is actually fine. The 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 the, the um, pricing engine they're using and uh, giving you the indicative vols on the mid price, it's pretty it's pretty good. And you know they they um, yeah I, I yeah it's good enough good enough for, government, so. for government workers that. <laughs> okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, the next question is a good one uh, again from Luke. Can you long a perp instead of owning the asset for a covered call campaign? Yeah, and you know, in fact, uh, not next week, but the week after, we're going to be talking. I think it's the week after, we're going to be talking about synthetic covered calls. And you know, traditionally, people think about a synthetic covered call as having a long dated call, like in the equity market, you buy a leap or something, and then you would sell, you know, monthly against that, for example, and then and then sell the leap at some point and close that campaign. But yes, absolutely. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how you can maybe even two or three X year return on covered call campaigns by using uh, futures or um, uh, basically a synthetic covered call. So look for that coming in the next two weeks. What else you got? Uh, since your collaterals in Bitcoin, when you close on the covered calls, even if you made money because Bitcoin price is higher, you'll have less Bitcoin as collateral. Um. Yes, yeah, so you're saying when your collateral is in Bitcoin, when you close the covered call, if you made money, because the Bitcoin price is higher, you'll have less Bitcoin. I mean, you'll spend you'll spend more Bitcoin to close it. Well, the thing is, if you're looking to accumulate Bitcoins, then you should just look at the um, the Bitcoin value of the options, not the dollar value. Let me show, quickly share my screen again and show you that. Um, so if we look at the price of the say thirty, this is the, the July, yeah, the thirty thousand July, um, you can see it's forty six point eight three volt. Um, the price is um, zero point zero seven zero one bitcoins per bitcoin. So that's um, was that seventy basis points. Um, so it's, it's going to cost you that much to to buy buy it, and you'll you'll receive that many bitcoins for selling it which is equivalent to about $2,100 at the moment. And of course, if you sold this 30,000 call, then you'd obviously want to be buying it back um, at somewhere for something less than 0 0.07 Bitcoins. That's all. Um, so the, 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 by the way you account, account for this stuff, whether it's in dollars or in Bitcoins, doesn't really matter. It, it's interchangeable. Mm. Um, 
So next question from Def. Uh, so when you wrote a call that gets close to the money, you roll it up. Yeah, ideally you can roll it out. Um, we'll roll it out. Um, but whether you roll it out and up is, is your choice. It really depends on the market and the sentiment at that time. But typically I'm rolling out and up just to give myself more space on both time and price. Uh, and we, we always try and do that for either a credit or a flat. So it doesn't cost us anything. Yes, yeah, so and you want to do it before it gets in the money, ideally. Sorry, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I was going to say it, it depends, right? If you think if you think that this, this for example, thirty one thousand is is overblown for Bitcoin at the moment, uh, and you know, I think there's an argument that says for it to rise from twenty five k to thirty one without any kind of retracement, that would be unusual. So it's reasonable to say if you were if you sold, I don't know, the thirty thousand and you were a thousand dollars in the money on this one. You might think, you know, well, I'll just I'll just roll this out to the next month um, at thirty thousand. So I'll just sell and in the money um, at thirty thousand. And effectively, what you're doing is selling a put um, uh, with a embedded future, um, and that's that's valid too. Um, or you can roll to at the money or uh, whatever your particular strategy is. Um, with a cover call campaign, sometimes you you will get the market just come up. And, you know, threaten your position way too early or blast through it. And you are you might need to just buy it back at a loss and accept that you're not going to get the same return for the next month's covered call as you are for the loss you've just paid. That just comes with the territory. Occasionally, you know, it's if, if earning 12% or 15% a year um, unleveraged was risk-free, everyone would do it. And the rate you'd get in your savings account would be 15%, right? So the reason you're getting 15% is because you're willing to, to accept some risk of having to to sometimes take a drawdown. Yeah, good call. Uh, another question from Jeff. What's the best uh, to keep eventual margin calls in check and not be surprised? So I'm not sure if you're talking about margin level. We talk about having, you know, using no more than about 30% maximum usually. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you mean, Def. Yeah, I think, I think he does. Um, so... Look, margin is your lifeblood in this game. Um, it almost doesn't matter how much um, PNL you've got if you're pri if you're private and you're not reporting PNL to anyone. What you, what matters is that you don't run out of margin. So you definitely need to keep margin under control. And a great way to do that is to um, balance your well, keep your delta close to zero is is a is a great way, great way to do that. So um, I'm I'm hedging into dollars on my account, so I'm always selling perpetuals, which means I'm always delta neutral in terms of dollars, but actually delta positive in terms of bitcoins. So so Deribit's margin system is always punishing me a little bit um, uh, and telling me that I've got risk to the upside. Um, but um, whenever that margin gets well, at the moment my margin uh, maintenance margin is sixty percent ish. That's telling me that I've uh, probably gone a bit too aggressively. I sold too many calls when they were cheap, and I'm paying for that now. And I've got, just got to wait for all that that time premium to come out. So basically, I'm just sitting here and making tiny adjustments to the book, pulling the gamma away from that at the money, reselling it as a strangle. That generally even that generally eases out the the eases the the um, the, the risk and keeps the margin system happy but if you're at a point where you're you know it's all got a bit strong and you've got to sort of 70 percent margin use then actually just consider taking some positions off the table um yeah. just bite the loss and yeah. and come back another day because um the lesson from my life is, is very very clear right you've got i've been trading uh professionally since i was 30 um <clears throat> i'm 55 now so 25 years you've got plenty of time to make money um don't be too eager to make a you know killing in one go because you might just not do it. And if you blow up trying to make that 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 fortune, you may not get another chance for another five years to come back to the table and try again. Mm -hmm. So I think I laboured about laboured this in our first um, call of the series, right? Which is you know, whatever you do, keep your margin bills down, and make sure you can come back tomorrow. Derabit will thank you, will thank you, <laughs> and you'll thank yourself. All right, next question from Luke. Uh, ever considered using DeFi strategies to generate returns on your asset? Uh, you're asking the right guy. Yes, I invented a, a, a product uh, based around this, actually. 
um, which I won't name because it was for a competitive exchange. But um, uh, and I, I, I was a huge fan of um, Uniswap um, v2, and I, I came to hate Uniswap v3. But I tried to see if I could find some strategies to use options to hedge Uniswap v3. Um, so, uh, and the thing about that is that you've got to be really careful uh, which pools you are in, which parts of the li liquidity you're taking, and you probably never quite make enough money in Uniswap to actually buy a perfect hedge in options, um, unless options imply vols are super low. Um, yeah, I've, so I've tried it and I've modelled it, and in fact, um, um, it's it's harder than harder than you might think. But I think you you could partially you could definitely partially hedge a Uniswap v3 pool. By buying some puts, uh, or buying some to strangle, you know. All right. Next question from Gene. When do you take profits with covered calls? Uh, do you wait uh, to reach seven percent ROI? I guess, for example. So, so the example I, I, I used there, Gene, was I was taking that to expiry. No matter what happened, taking expiry, and that's one one strategy people do. They say, doesn't matter in the money, out of the money. I'll just accept that. It, it, in Bitcoin, it's easy because it's cash settled. You don't have to worry about assignment. Um, selling the shares at the lower price, buying them back at the higher price. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. You just It's a difference and, and you carry on. Um, everyone has a different strategy. And we're going to talk about rolling and adjusting, I think, next week. I think whatever you're comfortable with. If I'm selling naked calls, I'm perfectly comfortable with taking those off the table, 20 to 25% ROI on them. If I sell them for a hundred bucks and now they're worth seventy five, I'll take those off and no risk gone away. I'd put twenty five bucks in my pocket, no problem. But you're talking about naked though, not not covered, right? That that was for naked. Yeah, for covered, you, you're probably going to want to give it a, a little more. Um, everyone's different. Everyone's different. I don't think that most people use the profit target. Now, in the case, do you remember when we brought up the the chart and uh, we sold the call and the and the market went straight down. That call would have been practically worthless. Most traders would have just taken the take, darn take thing off, off yeah. regardless of their strategies because what's the point? Um, or, sure or, enough, or, came... or even buy a call below the strike of the, of the call, call you sold so you've now got yourself yeah. some upside. You know. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's different ways you could have looked at that for sure. Mm -hmm. But you're going to want to take – you're going to want to try and take most of that premium. So I think that the only time that – people usually start to monkey with covered call campaigns is that they say, all right, if it goes against me and the market price gets close to my strike price or you know, at the money, I'm going to roll it. So they'll make adjustments there. That's typically what they're doing. Otherwise, most of the time, they're just letting it go as, to expire or until the delta becomes you know, like a five delta or something and just taking it off. So there is no right answer for that. Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you want to say, hey, 75%, if you're in the money, 75%, take it off, take it off. I mean, I'm a huge fan of getting rid of risk. Huge fan. Take the money, get rid of risk. And in, in this case, we're only selling 30 days. Maybe there's eight days left. Who cares? You got to wait eight days till the next one. That's fine. You know, no, no big deal. So uh, we, ha we had one more. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I just going to add one that one thing, which is that if you are going to take your money off the table at 70% ROI, you could just think of that as an early roll. So maybe you could sell the following month um, with five weeks to run. So actually, you, you, you the extra premium just goes into the ne into the next uh, month. And you'll mm -hmm. you'll earn it a bit slower, but but maybe more comfortably with less gamma. I'm sure. Uh, okay. There was one question we've missed because it was in the chat section. I've just moved it to the question section. Uh, that was I think that was from Sylvanus. Sylvanus, yeah. If you're short one X BTC. Uh, then selling these calls would be a loss if price shoots up. Uh, yeah, if you're already short Bitcoin and price goes up, you're going to lose anyway. And if you yeah. then sell more calls, then that's like selling even even more Bitcoin, even more Bitcoins. <clears throat> that's like um, a Texas hedge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if if the question actually meant if you're long Bitcoin, if you own a Bitcoin and you sell a covered call against it, and price the price of Bitcoin goes up. Then you are going to give up some of your Bitcoin, yes, because Deribit is a is done with, it delivers in the underlying currency. So you will pay your um, you'll receive Bitcoin as premium, and if you allow your 
option to get further in the money than the premium you received, you will give up some of your Bitcoin um, as part of uh, paying for it. And um, it's your choice whether you choose to accept that and then roll again in, so you're in the money so you, you re recover that Bitcoin in the premium or whether you want to roll the position early to avoid actually having to give up your Bitcoin. I think that's it. That's wonderful. Hey, you know what? Uh, we're, we're at an uh, hour, Richard. I, I got one more from oh, Def. Okay. Uh, this is a really, really interactive session. Um, I've tried to buy back before expiry, but open interest was so low, I couldn't close it. Oh, you mean liquidity was low. So that will happen if um, your option is uh, getting deep in the money. Yeah. Um, and one of, the, one of the shames is that not all market makers quote um, all the high delta options. You can actually mitigate that by, um, if you wanted to, if you've sold a call um, and, you, and it's in the money and you want to actually buy the call, then what you can actually do is um, uh, you could sell the put and then sell some future and mm -hmm. um, buy, uh, yeah, sell some future. And that would effectively close it. Uh, we need to cover that at some point. Uh, yeah, we would. And another thing I'll say there, Def, is that um, I mean, I've been in that situation before, too, where you know, something got in the money and as I went to look and it, there wasn't much of a market there. However, I will say this uh, on Deribit, if if there's a wide, widespread and it's not reasonable to get out, put in your bid, If you, in this case, if you're buying, buying, buying a callback at the mark price, there's often someone there, they're hidden but they're often there and you'll get executed. So you think there's no open, obviously put it in at the mark price, which is the, the, the fair value price and boom, it's done. So try and, that. And actually also um, have a look at the um, combo trading screen. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just quickly show you that. Sorry to, to bore everyone because I, I don't want to do a bit of disservice here. If you go to the strategy um, section uh, here and then go to combo books, you can actually, um, ask you can actually create an rfq for a a, a a position so if you want to do a um rfq is request for quote or anyway. request for quote yeah so you want to call calendar spread and let's say you wanted to roll 30th of june to the um oh, hang on we want to buy the so we're, we're, sorry we want to roll um 30th of to, june july? to today july 20th of july and the 30th of june strike was say um, 20, I don't know, 23,000, say. So it's, so there's no market. You see no bid, no ask. You can actually create, create an RFQ um, and you can tell them how many you want to do and which direction you want to go, hit confirm. And that, that will actually open up a, a market in this screen where somebody will come and quote you for that, for that. So even if it's not, that price isn't available on the outright screen, you can often get, get a fill here on the mm. strategy. Uh, and I'd recommend reading the Deribit Insights page about the strategy and combo screens. Um, yeah. yeah, good point. Fantastic. I think that we've uh, we've wrapped this up in record time. We've kept it uh, about an hour, which is a, a record for us. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, next week, we are going to continue on about the covered calls because there is a lot to talk about. And covered calls, as we can see, is a really effective at generating monthly income. Uh, if you're starting, if you're just getting into it, I, I think it's a fantastic way to go. We're going to talk about adjusting cover calls, rolling, we're going to talk about synthetics, all this kind of stuff. So once we put all this information together, you'll have everything you need to run a proper campaign and start to generate some monthly returns. So uh, Richard, you got anything else? Uh, just finally the poll. Apparently, according to the poll, uh, if there's a revolution in Russia, Bitcoin's going to either do nothing or go up. So we should mm -hmm. probably sell some puts. Or buy, buy some puts. <laughs> okay. So what happens if we lose on this trade? Who do we, who do we blame? Uh, we, we've got a list. <laughs> we've got a list. Everybody who asks us a question, it's your fault. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, guys, for joining us. I really appreciate it. And we will see you next week.